Welcome back, everybody, to another edition of Interview with a Roadie. This is the series where I get to sit down with artists, band members, roadies, and anybody else in the music industry, and we just have conversations about whatever we want. And in this video, I had the absolute pleasure of sitting down with Melissa and Adrian of Ad Infinitum. We got to talk about their upcoming album, their musical backgrounds, how the band met and formed, Adrian told us about what he's doing traveling all around Germany right now, and they even gave me their thoughts on how fans can help and support the bands that they love. And these guys were fantastic, man. Wonderful people. I cannot wait to possibly have them on the channel again in the future. And without further ado, sit back, relax, and enjoy this next 30 minutes or so of a conversation between myself, Melissa, and Adrian. Welcome back, everybody. Today, I have two very special guests with me. We have Melissa and Adrian from Ad Infinitum. How are you guys doing? Great. Amazing. How are Great. you? Perfect. I, I'm good. I'm good. I've been balancing um, trying to do stuff on the computer and chasing a six-month-old around my house. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's been fun, but it's kind of tiring at times, but it's pretty awesome. So before we started recording, I want to bring this up because this is cool. So uh, Melissa, you said you're at home. Adrian, tell us what you're doing right now because that sounded really cool. Okay, I have two friends here with me, also musicians from Cologne, and we're doing a road trip and playing music in the streets in whole Germany. And we just crashed at the flat of my grandparents. And yeah, we're about to hit the road afterwards interview so so what what cities have you stopped in so far are you pretty early on in your journey or are you have you been out for a while we just, we just started uh, we okay. were in a small town on the road but now we're here in heidelberg which is very a, a beautiful old german city and yeah that's awesome let's man. see what the what the evening will bring how how long are you guys doing your road trip for uh five days Oh, that's awesome, man. That's super cool, man. That's like, I we haven't been able to do anything like that in so long, especially, you know, my wife and I having a kid, we've been pretty kind of staying in, especially with COVID still pretty crazy in this area. Sorry if you hear my dogs. Um, <laughs> but um, man, this is super cool to have you guys. I know you guys are super busy with media, especially new album coming out next month and stuff like that. So um, let's, let's actually talk about that for a second, because with this YouTube channel for me, I've gotten to discover a lot of cool music over the last year. And I think you guys can probably relate when you're, when you're so focused in the music industry on one thing, you kind of have a little bit of blinders up and I've missed a lot over the years because I've been working for other bands. And when I started my channel, Melissa, your name is one that I kept hearing all the time. Like tons of people in Europe were like, you need to hear her bands. You need to hear her bands. And my introduction to you was actually on the Ding cover with Feierschwanz. And so then, cool. <laughs> yeah, and, and then I actually heard uh, The Dark Side of the Moon before I finally heard Ad Infinitum. It's kind of a recent thing, but I heard the new single, I watched the music video, and I was honestly blown away. And I really dug in afterwards and started doing like research on everybody in the band. And it's like, it's really impressive to me that everybody in the band, all you guys are like schooled musicians as well. And you don't see that a lot. Um, <laughs> so Melissa, you started, you started at a super young age from what I read, like singing in school, right? Yeah, I actually, I'm the only one who doesn't have a formal um, musical education, like conservatory. <laughs> I mean, I still count, I still count doing music in school when you're young as you know, okay. it's not necessarily self-taught. You still had a little bit of school, but I know what you mean. Yeah. So, so cool. um, I'm part of the club now. <laughs> <laughs> but what, well, how, how was that process for you? Cause what I read, you were singing in choir and then yeah. eventually when, when, when was it that you started developing harsh vocals and like doing stuff with that? In band? Oh. <laughs> so uh, obviously not in choir at school. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. But, um, um, I, I started, yeah, I started around six um, in a school choir, and then obviously we're. I was I was not really into choir music, so I stopped after a few years. Then I started to sing with some friends or on my own doing covers, horrible quality on YouTube, <laughs> and then um, finally I I um, 
joined my my first metal band in 2012 um, and continued my musical education but privately and at some point I discovered um, harsh vocals I mean I heard the harsh vocals before but I, I discovered Sacrimony by Camelot and the harsh vocals were done by Alisa White Gloves and I was like this is this is really cool and since this is really cool I want to be able to do it too <laughs> And uh, a lot of um, YouTube video followed, like tutorials, which didn't ta uh, teach me anything, except from one girl who explained, uh, yeah, you have to imagine that your mom is uh, telling you to, to clean your room and that you're pissed and you're like, yeah, yeah, I will do it. And then she comes back like half an hour later and you're like, <laughs> and this is how I got, I was like, yeah, that works for me. <laughs> that's amazing. It's, that's so awesome. So when you joined your first band, were you yeah. already practicing and doing harsh vocals or was that something you just started developing? No, you weren't. Okay. Afterwards. Yeah. After, because when, uh, when I, when I joined my first band, I was more like, yeah, I'm into metal, like, you know, Nightwish and, uh, <laughs> Evanescent. And then I got introduced to, to, uh, like, for example, Elevati, um, the agonist, arch enemy, obviously. And, uh, so I, it came afterwards. And then when I started to kind of master the technique, very very early stage my band was like hey you should use it and that's how i started to integrate it into my my singing that's awesome those are all bands too like i remember seeing the agonist um in like 2008 or something like that when Alyssa was still in the band and i was kind of blown yeah. away because you know i had listened to you know arch enemy with angela and then there were some other mm -hmm. female front of metal bands that were popular. You had Otep and Kitty and stuff like that. But Alyssa was one of the first people that I saw in the late 2000s. That was really for me, like, I think I remember telling somebody, I was like, we're going to start seeing a lot more female vocalists in metal. And we have, and it's awesome. And one of the things mm -hmm. I really um, have enjoyed lately is how that that line is kind of getting blurred now because at first you used to get a lot of people that would separate the male and female vocalists and stuff like yeah. that and now like i saw uh recently a um a twitch stream that vicky from the agonist was doing and somebody was asking her who are your female vocalists and she's like why do we always separate it like that why can't we just yeah. favorite vocalists and include everybody because you know the fact of the matter is it's like there are female vocalists in metal that are just as good if not better than some of the men so there shouldn't be any differentiation yeah. but um it's it's really cool man it's all it's really funny how people fall into that stuff because where where i'm from in the u.s most everybody that i know is self-taught there are some mm. pretty major music schools here but not many um and speaking of that i wanted to move on to adrian as well um your backstory with guitar is pretty wild man i was reading like you started jazz guitar at a super young age and you were playing a lot of big concerts and then are you finished with your studies at university or are you are you still doing it uh fun 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 thing because uh i stopped because i graduated when i when corona started and all those cool plans that i had for the actually working life like fell apart in an in instant so i yeah i uh graduated in 2020 Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and and you, and you were at the University of Cologne, right? Yeah, at Cologne. Awesome. And yeah, that's a pretty pretty nice school, and it's actually pretty loose. You can do what you want, and I mean, you have the tests and stuff, and you should keep on doing what you like. But it's not like that. That the teachers are like you have to practice this at 200 BPM and I want to hear this in one week. It's not like that. That's yeah. uh, more be on your own. And um, yeah. So it's, so, it it's not, so, so it's not like the movie Whiplash where your, your instructors are like <laughs> no. beating, beating the crap out of you and stuff. <laughs> um, no, so, absolutely. So, so how did you, I always find it fascinating that, um, and I know it's close proximity, but a lot of these European bands, it's interesting how you guys all find each other. How, Melissa, how did you find Adrian and the rest of your band for that matter? Because, I mean, you guys are kind of all over the place. Um, so I first, um, I first talked to Nick 
I, I, I've known Nick for several years now. We've been touring together. And, uh, and um, funny thing, I, um, Nick was playing in, in Munich and I was in Munich at that time. And uh, I went to his show and uh, I said, hey, I, I have this band. Uh, it was first a solo project and I wanted to be a band, a real band with, with people who are also um, interested, like interested and invested in the music and, and the whole thing, not just hired guns. And I, I said, hey, do you want to be part of it? And he said, yeah, that's cool. And uh, I obviously I showed him some music before he said yes. <laughs> and, uh, and then it was like, you know, Nick, he can play literally anything. So I was like, okay, you want to be part of it? What do you want to play? <laughs> ah, guitar, drums. And he was like, yeah, I kind of want to play the drums. And then he said, oh, I have someone perfect for the guitar. And then that's how I got to know Adrian because, I mean, Adrian, tell the story of how you got to know Nick because you're telling it better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fun thing because uh, Nick and I met when we were children, when we were like 12 years old or something around that. And we both grew up in Bavaria, uh, state of Germany. And there are um, youth programs for young musicians uh, who want to, yeah, have good teachers and stuff. And there's this youth big band of Bavaria, and we met in this program, and then we didn't see each other for over ten years. And I was studying in Cologne, and he was studying in Mannheim, and yeah, then we met back up in Cologne at a concert of Serenity and uh, Melissa was singing there as well. Um, yeah, and I don't know, two months later, after we met after this long time, he was like, hey, do you wanna join, join this band? And um, this, this was a moment where I was like, wow, you could like 10 years later, you get this offer and now it changed like everything for me. Like it's everything my, at Infinitum becomes like the center of my hope and my dreams and everything. And just because I met Nick when I was 12 years old. That's so amazing. Fun. That's so wild, man. It's it's kind of it's kind of interesting that like with my background being a roadie and being a guitar tech, I've had similar situations where it's like somebody that I toured with years and years ago, like 10 years ago, will call me out of the blue and be like, Hey, this person needs a guitar tech. Would you like to do this job? And it's that's like I've been working for the same artist for the past six years, and that's how I got the job. Similar fashion. It was somebody that I knew from years ago just randomly called me out of the blue and was like, "Would you like this job?" And then when I took it, I didn't think it would turn into what it did. And it's it's that's really cool, man. Um, that's so cool. And it's it, it's wild because watching watching the performances, and I went back. So after I watched um, the latest single. I went back and I listened to chapter one and it's fascinating to me that just from watching live performances and listening and stuff like you can tell very quickly that everyone in the band is more than capable at what they're doing. And it's so funny because I think I mentioned like when you were playing, I was like a minute into the song, I was like, this guy looks like he has the capability of just absolutely shredding if he wanted to. And what I really appreciated was like the solo in the song was, it's very tasteful. It wasn't anything over the top or in your face or like showing off. It was very tasteful. And the one that one thing I want to ask you about is um, the, the Strandberg eight string. How did you get onto that? Because obviously that's not your typical, you know, jazz guitar usually, but Strandberg's, you know, a pretty big name in the in the business, especially with some of their designs. How did you um, how did you pick that up and start playing with Strandberg? Uh, my first eight string actually was an Ibanez and Meshuggah uh, signature model, and it was heavy. It was it's Ibanez. I, I don't. <laughs> yeah. it, it worked. It worked definitely for the first album, and then I was at Toman. Maybe you know Toman. It's the mm -hmm. big music distributor and I was just there for playing and I don't know why I was there actually because maybe because of my father because he was looking for another bass and I saw a Strandberg and was like yeah it's not my thing but maybe I try it and it actually blew me, blew me away it was a six string and 
the most interesting thing about this with this guitar was the sustain and because it kept on singing and it didn't want to stop and this is where i was like the next eight string that is available i will buy it blind and uh, but there was nothing around not Tolman was having it not any music store in germany was having an eight string by strandberg but um i found one and it was the sarah longfield signature and was like yeah fine it's the metal edition of strandberg let's go for it and yeah it didn't let me down it's uh, very nice to have and i know many many people are hating on because of the headless design and everything but <laughs> once no the thing is actually i'm i'm pretty active in sports and stuff but when you stand like for two hours with an extended range guitar you feel it mm -hmm. you feel it and it's and it's not a good feeling and especially because you have this much wider fretboard and you have the um the head stock on it you always it always falls down when you don't have your left hand on it so it absolutely makes sense and i'm with up to everything that makes sense and is comfortable and it sounds okay. So. Yeah. On top of that, like you said, the headless guitars do have a major advantage and sustain is one of those things. Like um, I think somebody, I think it was after that music video, I had a lot of comments, people asking like, why headless guitar? Why are so many people using that? And you know, the, the weight, like you mentioned is one of the things, but yeah, like it's got better sustain and like clarity and stuff like that. It's great. Um, so moving moving back, uh, Melissa, I wanted to ask you, Melissa, you've been featured on a lot of other bands' albums, like guest spots on songs and stuff like that. It's always seemed to me that the European music community is super tight, like way tighter than over here in North America. Did you know a lot of these bands beforehand, like, you know, Warkings and Feuerschwanz and stuff like that? Or did they like randomly reach out to you to have you on songs with them? both actually um with war kings i knew uh i knew some of the band members um <laughs> i knew some of Sorry. the band members um for uh first fans i didn't know them at all they just contacted me through napalm records and um and uh i i, I knew the music because i i had heard it but you know i'm not from the german-speaking part of switzerland so th their music is mainly in german so I, I had a very, very limited um, opinion or, or, or knowledge about this band. So I was like, okay, what are they doing? That's pretty cool. Yeah, okay, I do it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, but it, it really depends. Uh, I don't always know the people beforehand. Yeah, that's wild because with Fire Schwanz, that's become an interesting thing because obviously now you're doing the dark side of the moon with Jenny yeah. and Hans and like, um, I, I read online the story of how that project came to be, but you never, you never know with stuff that you read online. So yeah. was, was that literally just because of a bet that you had with Hans? Literally. Yeah. <laughs> um, because we, did, <laughs> we, we, we released pretty much at the same time, marching on Versailles and Ding. And one day I was just, I was on the couch and I was like, I'm going to write to Hans. The first one who reached the million views can give a, a dare to the other. And he was like, okay, deal. And then a few days later, he's like, I win. <laughs> and I said, yeah. I mean, <laughs> so, it was, I mean, he kind of, I'm, in all honesty, had a leg up. They're covering a huge seed song, but like still, I mean, I think it's a great project. I think even though he won a bet, I mean, you guys all won on that one because it's it's really interesting. Um, yeah. And are you guys working on a full length album with Dark Side of the Moon? Yeah, we and are. Is it, is it majority covers and renditions of like pop culture stuff or are you guys doing originals as well? We're doing originals as well. A majority of, of songs from um, cinematography, from video games, series, but we also um, uh, have a few original songs. That's awesome, man. That's super cool. It's funny, um, you know, a Adrian will probably appreciate this too, but like, I started this YouTube thing randomly. Like I was in the same boat when COVID started, we all got sent home from tour. We had nothing to do. So decided to start YouTube and do all this fun stuff. But in the year that I've been doing this, my biggest viewer base is Germany by a lot. Yeah. 
Like, so I've been discovering all these German bands lately. And I've even started taking like German lessons on Duolingo and stuff like that. And like, oh. <laughs> I'm not good yet. I'm like practicing on my daughter when I'm like feeding her and stuff. And it's just funny, but um, Germany, there, there's so many good music scenes in Europe and it kind of blows my mind that the U S in terms of mainstream market is very walled off from everything else because there are so, I personally think the music scene in Europe is way better than what we have here right now. And that's the personal taste, but there's so many great bands from Germany that I've been discovering um, Switzerland as well. Alveti is one of my favorite bands, you know, coming from Switzerland, mm. a lot of good stuff coming out of the UK and Sweden and Finland. And it's like the whole area is just great music. Um, and moving on. Cause I don't know. I know you don't have a ton of time. I want to talk about this new album for a second. So chapter two comes out on October 29th and yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, but I saw that you basically self-produced the entire thing until the final process, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, how, how, how is, how is that compared to working with a producer full-time in the studio? Was it better for the creative energy or did you just feel like you, less pressure or how does that work? Um, yeah, we were actually much braver because, um, we knew we wouldn't have to argue with a producer to stand up for our ideas. And we were just like, we like it or we don't. And most of the time we appreciate each other's skills and just, yeah, this, that, that on top. Yes, please. And that's how it worked. And it was a pretty creative, uh, we had a, yeah, everything in the recipe actually. And um, yeah, it was super fun and loose and we could talk about everything and yeah. Did you, did you, can, you guys go to a studio somewhere and work on the majority of it? Or were you mostly working from home like because of restrictions and stuff like that? We were mostly working from home and exchanging um, ideas through WeTransfer. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, Cor Corby and, and Adrian live in the same town, so they, they, they met a few times as well. Uh, but yeah, we um, the, the, the only moment where we all met in the studio was during the, the mix uh, of the album at, at Jacob Hansen Studios. And it was, it, it was great. Um, like Adrian said, we had a lot of freedom, but we also had much more responsibility because this time there was not any external, um, um, how to say? Um, influence. Influence, exactly. Influence and also, um, you know, a double check like from, from someone who has the overview. So it was us and we had the, the, the responsibility to create something that would follow perfectly chapter one, but while being more us. That's awesome because, you know, in that situation, I think the important thing for for people to realize when it's self-produced is that what they're going to hear from that album is exactly the way that you guys wanted to deliver it. The writing is 100 percent. You guys, the arrangement is 100 um, percent. And having somebody like Jacob Hansen mixing it afterwards is not going to hurt. I mean, that's one yeah. of those names. <laughs> that's one of those names that you just see and you're like, oh, this is going to sound good. It's like. <laughs> But um, yeah. when so bringing in a producer in post for mixing and stuff like that, um, were you does I'm kind of curious because obviously Jacob has a huge name in the producing industry and stuff like that. But like, did he really just stick to his mixing or did he try and tell you guys to change anything? <laughs> um, I think he had a few suggestions, especially post production, like. Um, yeah, he, ha he had some ideas. We worked also with uh, Elias Hamlet for the, the the orchestrations, and Jacob had also some ideas here and there, and 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 minor suggestions. But the, mostly the songs are the demo 2.0. Uh, it's it's very much what we what we wrote. Yeah, that's awesome, man. I'm super excited to hear it. It's like one of my favorite things that um that this channel has got me back into doing is is pre ordering albums. And it started becoming a thing like I've been just pre-ordering vinyls and displaying them on the wall. And it's kind of become a thing that like 
you know, people that watch are like, they know if I like something, it's going to eventually be on the wall back here. And the only thing is right now, because everything ships from Europe, I think I have like seven or eight vinyls still in the mail somewhere that I'm waiting on. But <laughs> the, the second the second I heard uh, the last single, like I, I pre-ordered the new album. I'm super excited about it. And I would I would I would highly suggest people do the same because um, I've talked about it on my channel a lot. Like, I don't think people understand how much um, pre-orders help the bands in terms of you know, first week numbers. And it also helps with, you know, booking agents, booking tours and stuff like that. Um, so one of the last things I want to ask before I let you go, um, I saw that you guys have done some shows recently. How's that been going? That was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dude, I, so much fun. Oh, I bet, man. So very uh, slowly, but surely a lot of my, a lot of my other friends in Europe that are in bands have started doing shows and it's like, it just looks like everybody's just having a blast. Did it feel somewhat normal getting back on stage or was it a little weird at first? I think the very first show felt very normal because um, we played in Czech Republic and there was like no restrictions. There was thousands of people in front of us. It was unreal, completely yeah. unreal. That's awesome. And I saw your next show Correct me if I'm wrong. I think the next show is on October 29th. Is that like a CD release show in Switzerland? Absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, come over. Oh, dude, yeah. <laughs> I would I would absolutely love to. My wife and I have literally been toying around with the idea of moving to Europe at some point just like because <laughs> like that we've we, just from this channel alone, we've made so many friends from over there and um, like Germany's looking like a good option. Netherlands might be a good option. We're still, we're still trying to figure it out. But so before I let you get to your next thing, I always ask this to the people I have on, in your opinion, as the artists that are in the band, what is the best thing that fans that want to support your music, what is the best thing that they can do? What would you recommend they do to support your music? Melissa. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> several things i mean like you mentioned pre-ordering or pre-saving also like on spotify or any platform is very nice for us because then like you said um promoters get the first week numbers and we get to maybe enter the charts and that's a good indication for promoters bookers for any other band uh, of what we like the interest for the band and it's easier to get booked for tours for this uh, with this um I mean, sharing our music is just so, so great as well, because um, every time we, we release a single, we have so much luck with this, but we've had so many people sharing our music. And then a lot of people, a lot of new people joined the, the, the big family. So it, it, it's just amazing when we see this happening. And um, yeah, of course, I would like to mention come to the shows because that's the most beautiful thing that happens when yeah. we can actually meet the people. Yeah. That's awesome. It's funny because the the sharing of the music is that's that's the one thing that every single person I've talked to has said. Like it seems like a lot of people are are definitely all about that. Like if you like it, share it because you never know if somebody yeah. hears that it might get them into it and they'll go buy the album and then go to a show and stuff like that. So well, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you guys very, very much for your time today. I know um, one thing people probably don't know is that when you guys have media days, they usually book you guys all day long. So uh, I, I, I appreciate you guys giving me a little bit of your time. Um, I'm looking Pleasure. forward to the new album. I can't wait for it to come out. I can't wait for some new stuff. Do you guys have any other videos or anything else coming out anytime soon? Yes. Uh, Adrian? All right. All right. <laughs> yeah, actually, I don't know when this interview is going to come out, but uh, next week or a new single. And of course, um, a single before the with the album release and a few other surprises we are currently working on um, but it's another thing I wanted to to mention because of the of the um, thing that fans can do um, I think it's kind of important to say this because Spotify and stuff is getting a lot of shit especially in my bubble for musicians yeah. but please don't stop streaming on Spotify because I mean, of course, buy the album, pre-order, pre-save, but um, not playing it on Spotify isn't helping because we need the clicks and the numbers. And that's another indicator 
how successful is the spend and of course we need you to stream yeah um, yeah. yeah that's and, a very, and also you know point. yeah and also um like like adrian mentioned we see a lot of comments like oh great i uh i streamed 100,000 times i can i can buy a piece of chocolate no it doesn't happen like this it's just like the it's it's a new way of listening music that's listening to music that also bands have to embrace because the more you promote your music the more people stream the more streams the more uh, you also get uh, you also have a revenue through streaming and for us for example it's been one of the main reasons why we've been able to record more music videos record uh, more material because we actually earn some money through streaming so we don't want people to think oh if i stream i'm, I'm doing bad things for for the bands i like I, I only have to buy the album and go to the shows no streaming is actually good a good way and it's the the new way yeah and i think i think a lot of people think that because they focus too much on the revenue part they don't understand like yeah. you're starting to see accolades that bands are receiving for streaming numbers like like yeah. you know a million streams on this so like those numbers, like you said, affect everything. It's not purely revenue, but you know, that is a big part of it for bands. So, well, I appreciate it guys. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day. Adrian, be safe on the road, play some good music, yes. enjoy. And, um, you know, maybe, uh, maybe one of these days after, uh, after the album comes out and you guys have some more shows, maybe we can catch back up and see how everything's been going. Yeah. It'll be a great be. pleasure. Thank you for, for having us. Yeah, absolutely. We'll take care and hopefully we'll talk to you guys soon. Thank you.